This is Radio EcoShock with Alex Smith. Welcome to my third encounter with Dr. Tim Garrett from the University of Utah. Tim is an atmospheric scientist. He's studying one of the big unknowns of our future climate, the behavior of clouds. Garrett also publishes papers on what I will call the physics of large-scale economy. He says civilization is a heat engine, and believe me, that is a rabbit hole where even confirmed preppers should shiver a bit. Let us explore the clouds, the climate, and the Arctic with a side order of inevitable collapse. Tim Garrett, welcome back to the eclectic airspace known as Radio EcoShock. Thanks very much for having me, Alex. I like talking with you, Tim, and I found a good index to your recent work linked in tweets at a place called At Dissipative Sis. Is that named because we inhabit a dissipative system? Uh, very much so. I actually changed the name to Nephalog, N-E-P-H-O-L-O-G-U-E, if anyone is interested. And uh, yes, it is based on the idea that everything that we identify in the universe in some way or another is a dissipative system. And what I mean by that is that it consumes energy from its environment, high potential energy, and has internal circulations within it. And then it converts that energy into unavailable, low potential energy. That energy may be available to something else, but that is really the means by which any system exists and evolves and grows and ultimately shrinks. September 10th, your tweet, quote, Arctic air pollution already high, but it's not super clear whether it will increase or decrease. And you reference New Science published September 3rd, 2018, in the AGU journal Earth's Future. Tell us why the picture there is still unclear. The Arctic's quite an interesting place. I've, I've been working a lot, even since I was, I guess, a graduate student, on how pollution from mid-latitudes might be affecting clouds in the Arctic, clouds in particular. And it, it's there is something where we might think that the Arctic is really should be a pristine place because so few people live up there. But the fact is, is that air from mid-latitudes where most people live tends to be polluted. There's also forest fires. And this pollution, this aerosol pollution, blows northwards and has the capacity to affect the Arctic in many ways. One is to be deposited on snow and make it darker. And another is to change cloud properties in the Arctic. And it turns out that the Arctic is unusually sensitive to this pollution. The clouds, um, it, we, we found differences of as much as a factor of a seven times more sensitive to the pollution than clouds at uh, lower latitudes. And there's two things that could go on here. Um, as the climate warms, we are very concerned about how the Arctic will change since the Arctic seems to be changing about twice as rapidly measured by temperature as the rest of the world, uh, taken as a whole. And there's two things that might happen here. One is that the aerosol pollution could increase due to increased industrialization in the Arctic as shipping lanes open up, so for example, and then the Arctic warms and becomes more habitable. And that might change clouds in a way that both warms and cools the Arctic, uh, depending on the season. But also as the Arctic warms up, it's going to become wetter. And if it becomes wetter, there will probably be more rain. And if there is more rain, that could act to clean up the Arctic by scavenging the pollution from the air. And we know just from experience that often if the air is polluted, along comes a rainstorm and things clean up. Well, the same thing could happen in the Arctic. It could go from quite a polluted place at times to something far cleaner. So there's big questions in that way, and it's, it's, it's an interesting problem. Yes, you co-authored another paper with Q. Koopman uh, about this Arctic pollution that was in November 2017 in Geophysical Research Letters. And to me, that paper is a big deal. First, we know that Arctic ecosystems at ground level are sensitive. They're even fragile. Why do you say in the Arctic the clouds are also fragile? They're right at the edge of their existence. Yeah, they're... That's a nice way of putting it, right at the edge of their existence. They they barely form 
Um, I mean, the atmosphere in the Arctic tends to be quite quiet. They do get storms, but for the most part, the atmosphere is what we would call stable, which means you don't tend to see big puffy cumulus clouds forming in the Arctic. It tends to be this very shallow stratus clouds, and they can be just maybe a few tens of meters thick. And so they're just barely there. You know, it could be clear, it could be cloudy. And it turns out if the air is polluted due to pollution emissions, say, from Europe, that can change the cloud properties by quite a lot. I mean, the main way it changes them is to make the droplets in the clouds smaller. Uh, one surprising thing might be for most people that even though the Arctic is well below the freezing point, clouds can tend to be made of liquid nonetheless down to quite low temperatures of you know minus 20 degrees Celsius. And they do change to ice. We just had a paper accepted in geophysical research letters which showed that the pollution seems to make it much more likely that the clouds will switch from liquid to ice in the Arctic. So what happens is the pollution comes along. Something about the pollution is enabling those liquid droplets to switch to ice crystals. And when they turn to ice crystals, they tend to precipitate. They form a delicate snow. And that can change the lifetimes of the clouds. Now, how that will affect the climate is uncertain because the Arctic climate system, like any climate system, is complicated. There are many feedbacks back and forth. But this is an important ingredient of the problem, we think. The pollution from the mid-latitudes is disturbing the Arctic environment in surprising ways. Are clouds in the Arctic important to the global climate system? That's an excellent question. I don't know. This is, You can imagine ways that they would be. So one area that I've been working hard on is trying to um, show how the clouds tend to cool the climate in the Arctic in the summer when they are perturbed by aerosols. And then this aerosol perturbation tends to warm the Arctic surface in the winter. Now, how that translates to changes at mid-latitudes is not so well known, although there are people, scientists like Jennifer Francis, who are arguing that the rapid Arctic warming is having profound effects on the temperatures of at winter in places like the United States. And this is highly contentious. I'm not an expert on it myself, but there are many people who are arguing that the Arctic is not isolated from where most of us live, but rather it can have its changes can have substantial um, effects on the climate at mid-latitudes. You know, we just went through a second or third summer of almost being burned down here and living in wildfire smoke. And the September 2018 study that you referenced by Jay Schmall found, quote, in the summer, boreal forest fires cause high levels of atmospheric pollution. But if I read your work correctly, you seem to say that wildfire smoke did not contribute to the formation of Arctic clouds. That was one of the surprising results. Yes, there is a lot of forest fire smoke in the Arctic. I have seen it in my own eyes. I was uh, aboard an airplane once in the Arctic for a field program. We were up, up at, uh, at the north slope of Alaska for six weeks, and we were flying through clouds and in the atmosphere, and sometimes it would look like we were in the smog of Los Angeles. And I didn't know at that time, because this was back in the 90s, where that, 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 that smog layer came from. But now I think there's a realization that at levels like, at, let's say, five kilometers above the surface, these smog layers are due to forest fires. And they just get up there and then they hang around for a long time. So these are quite common. However, what happens is that these aerosols from the forest fires are, tend not to be at the same levels that the clouds are at. So you, one way of imagining it might be that 
um, that air that was, is polluted was originally hot and dry. That's why there were forest fires, and the forest fires are convective. They create um, upward motions because they're hot, and that takes the aerosols to places that, where, that aren't favorable for forming clouds. So the major thing we found was that the pollution that is affecting clouds in the Arctic tends to be what we would call anthropogenic pollution, uh, human-made pollution. And is that human-made pollution that arrives in the Arctic? And we know it is because Jason Bach showed us gray glaciers in Greenland just from the landing of all those aerosol particles. But is it dealing with what I would say global pollution, a sort of widely dispersed level pollution, or do local sources matter more when we're talking about clouds? When we talk about local sources, I guess there are two ways you could refer to it. Local sources in the Arctic have an outsized impact on the Arctic. They're just there, so they're in the right place at the right time. Local sources at mid-latitudes can also have a profound effect on the Arctic because there are atmospheric air motions that naturally take plumes of aerosol pollution from places like Europe and increasingly Asia to the Arctic along transport pathways that directly take the aerosols to the Arctic without a great deal of dilution. The global aerosol level is actually on average fairly uniform because of this reason that precipitation is everywhere and it tends to remove pollution from the atmosphere. So there is a background aerosol level in the globe as a whole and it does go up and down a bit depending on the global pollution levels but that is not the major driving force for change in the Arctic. It tends to be these narrowly focused blooms that come from specific pollution sources like factories or smelters or even just general people going back and forth to work. We want to know how Arctic clouds function in a global climate model. You and your colleagues have new science to help answer that question more simply. Please tell us about your paper published in the Journal of Geophysical Research in July 2018. And this is the work that I'm particularly excited by right now. I think increasingly when we are thinking about forecasting future climate, there's a growing recognition that the biggest unknown and I don't think I'm exaggerating here, and whether uh, the degree of climate change that we will see for a given amount of carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere is how clouds will respond to a change in climate. So the issue here is that we have um, forcings and feedbacks. So the forcings of climate change are the basic greenhouse gases, the, the dominant one here that is driving the change is carbon dioxide, of course. But then there are feedbacks, which are that as the carbon dioxide concentrations go up, temperatures go up, and then the water vapor concentration will tend to increase. And water vapor is a very strong greenhouse gas. It's the dominant greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. So when we talk about climate change, it's actually more about the water vapor than the CO2, even if the CO2 is a trigger, the water vapor is a bullet. And that's a positive feedback. And there are other feedbacks, too, related to how the atmospheric temperature structure will change and also just that, like the element on your stovetop, a hotter planet will emit more efficiently um, infrared radiation to the atmosphere. It will cool down more efficiently. So that's a negative feedback. And there's clouds. And so clouds are the hard thing to do because they are incredibly complicated. I mean, in terms of complication, they are really, I think, the most common, the most complicated natural phenomenon on our planet, with the exception of perhaps volcanoes, um, which are more sporadic. But just as normal things, the clouds are incredibly energy dense. They emit they consume massive amounts of energy due to latent heat release from condensation. And that creates an extraordinary range of phenomena. I mean, ranging from every snowflake being different, 
created by a cloud to the turbulent motions of the cloud spanning scales from millimeters to kilometers and that the clouds themselves can span hundreds of kilometers in storm tracks. And representing this variability in the climate model is almost impossible because the climate models have grid boxes that may be tens of kilometers on each side. And they just don't have the resolution to pick out the small-scale cloud processes. Now, people try to, what they say is parameterize this, but the parameterizations are themselves very uncertain and it's almost like a Pandora's box. Every time we narrow down one process, we reveal smaller scale processes that are themselves uncertain. So we, the climate models right now seem to suggest that clouds will amplify climate change by a considerable degree. So if we expect water vapor to have one effect, then clouds will add to that and they will make the planet warmer. The challenge is constraining that, and we haven't been very successful at constraining how much clouds will warm the climate. It's really, really uncertain. So I thought, well, maybe there's a totally different way to come about this problem. And I tried to solve the problem of cloud sizes and distributions using basic thermodynamics. And what I found, what I described in this paper is that we can actually describe the numbers and shapes and sizes of clouds in an incredibly complex tropical cloud field to an extremely high degree of accuracy using just a few lines of physics rather than using an incredibly complicated um, cloud model. So there's cloud models that are at very high resolution. And I found that I could reproduce the statistics for cloud sizes within um, a cloud model of one billion grid points run every two seconds in a um, massive supercomputer. I think it was 300,000 processor hours in this supercomputer simulation. It was possible to reproduce a representation of a cloud field in that simulation accurately to within 13% using just a little bit of physics. And that was, I, that's, I think, important because it dramatically simplifies the problem. It shows that um, we can reduce the cloud problem effectively to a point. All we need to know is the stability of the atmosphere. And if we know the stability of the atmosphere, which is quite predictable, then we can unravel statistically an entire tropical cloud field. We can show, we don't know which cloud where might look like Mickey Mouse. But we can say that statistically, we will have a certain number of big clouds and a much larger number of small clouds. And that this obeys statistical properties that are simple to describe mathematically and are simple to predict. All right, I got to get back to my original ask. What will happen to Arctic clouds as the planet warms one, two, or four degrees C? I think that the prediction is that cloud cover will increase. So as the sea ice melts in the Arctic, then the exposure to the ocean will increase. And so the atmosphere will become more unstable because there is moisture and heat that's coming from the ocean. And that will naturally lend itself to an increase in cloud cover. And these clouds will tend to act as a blanket, and the prediction is that these clouds will tend to, on average, warm the surface, and in a way leading to a positive feedback that accelerates um, sea ice loss, because the clouds basically ask, yeah, they act as a blanket for the surface and warm it and then lead to more clouds. Please consider supporting Radio EcoShock. Find out more at our website, ecoshock.org. You can write me at any time. The address is radio at ecoshock.org. This is Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. My guest is Tim Garrett, Professor of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Utah. 
Tim, let's get our head out of the clouds for a minute. You argue our current civilization will collapse sooner or later. In a four-minute Vimeo, you conclude something has to give. What doesn't add up for you? Well, it's, it's interesting you say get heads out of the clouds because I think actually there is there are incredible parallels between civilization and clouds. These are complex systems that consume a lot of energy that grow explosively into their by consuming energy from their environment and matter from their environment and ultimately reach a point where they've consumed all that is available and die. And I think, you know, for clouds, we can see this all the time. For civilization, we are still in this explosive growth phase. So the point I am trying to make is that this explosive growth phase that we are in currently with our global economy for civilization as a whole is based upon consuming energy and matter from our environment. That is what keeps all the circulations going. If we did not consume energy from our environment, all of civilization would grind to a halt. We would die out of starvation, and our concept of a global economy would die with us. But that's not what's happening now. Right now, we are discovering new energy resources at quite a rapid rate in one way or another, whether it's renewables or fossil fuels or whatever it is. Not even shale oil is a, is a, is a, a substantial source of energy. And that's enabling civilization to grow extremely rapidly. But there is a consequence to this. Growth cannot be sustained forever. It's simply impossible. Eventually, the sources of energy will be depleted. I mean, just to take as an example, it's a simple calculation. We will consume as much energy and raw materials from our environment in the next 30 years as we have since 1750. That's an incredible number. I mean, we are going to double civilization over again in the next 30 years over what we have in the past 250. And this is just a consequence of, the, of exponential growth. And in 30 years, we will, our energy demands and raw material demands will be twice what they are today at current rates of growth. And then you think, well, that's just 30 years. What's 30 years beyond that? Again, that would be a quadrupling. And so, you know, maybe we can do that. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. There's, there's lots of unpredictable things out there. It seems in some sense impossible because our environment is already starting to groan under the burden of our consumption. But perhaps um, there's, there, there's a means to continue this growth. But growth necessitates um, an accelerating rate of production of waste products. And there is a variety of waste products that we are increasingly swimming in. One of these is, of course, carbon dioxide, which leads to climate change. And there's other things, too, like topsoil depletion and nitrification of our waterways, uh, depletion of fish stocks in the ocean. Um, the, the waste products of our consumption are going to accelerate. And so when I say something has to give, I think we are left in a very difficult position. Um, if civilization does not start to collapse very soon and the growth stalls and then not just stalls, but then civilization into, enters into a profound decline, if civilization does not do that, then it may be forced into that decline under either the burden of its consumption of resources or under the burden of the waste products it has produced, either due to climate change or um, a deteriorating environment. And this is probably going to happen quite rapidly because we are not talking about centuries here. We are talking about decades. In a tweet that you posted August 15th, you linked to a New York Times article where even climate-aware Germany still depends on coal for up to 40% of its energy, and you say, historically, new energy sources add to the mix rather than replace their older foundation. 
That sounds pretty bleak for the future of green energy like solar and wind. That's not what we're all dreaming about. Yeah, I mean, we would like to think that solar and wind might replace coal, but if you think about it, we well, his, I mean, if, if nothing else, historically that has not been the case. Our consumption of various energy sources, it does go up and down over time. But in general, we have been introducing new energy sources, and these tend to be additive. So you think at one point in the distant past, we consumed much less energy, and then our primary source of energy would have been wood. And then we added coal, and then we added oil, and then we added natural gas and nuclear, and now we're adding renewables. And it's not that the total energy consumption is stabilizing or going down. It is continuing to increase with each addition. It's like we add a new degree of freedom in the system. And civilization is not made of energy. It's made of matter. We use this energy from the renewables to build more of civilization. And then when you build more of civilization by consuming raw materials, using energy to consume raw materials from the environment, and convert it into civilization, civilization grows. When civilization grows, its demands for energy of all types increases, not just for renewables, but of all types. And so there is no obvious link between adding new energy sources, new types of energy, and a reduction in old energy sources. It just simply enables us to do more. So myself, I don't think about wind and solar as being particularly green. They are sources of energy. Our civilization is not made of energy. It is made of matter. We use energy to extract raw materials from our environment. If we add new energy sources, that will just enable us to rape the environment further. That's what we use the energy for. It is to extract raw materials in one way or another. Well, as part of your analysis, I'm still burning wood. So that hasn't been replaced. We're still using the old systems, as you say. Now, in several places, you suggest we may revisit a system-wide depression like the 1930s. I'm not sure the 1930s is a good analysis or that we can reach any historical precedent from where we are now. I mean, maybe the 1930s will seem good or mild compared to a climate-ravaged future or Maybe humanity will squeeze into a brand new place. Your thoughts? Yeah, well, who's who said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes? Um, yeah, yeah, of course, we can't return to the 1930s. Um, I wonder, I'm not a historian, but I think we can look back at various times in history and say when uh, nations or you know, regions or what civilization as a whole even has been more resource constrained and that competition for resources has increased, then the competition plays out in predictable ways. I mean, one of those ways, of course, is wars and other ways is inflation. I I would not be surprised to see more of a fragmentation of civilization in the future as we have increased resource scarcity. Right now, we're at a point where we are growing more rapidly than we ever have before, but that rate of growth is has stagnated, and that was something that happened in the 1930s. It wasn't that the rate of growth was comparable to today, but it stagnated, and I think what that means is in a capitalist society that is predicated upon growth, there is competition for growth among countries, perhaps. So that if one country grows faster, then that necessarily means that another country must grow more slowly. And, of course, that means winners and losers, and nobody wants to be the loser. You're listening to Ecoshock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org. Welcome back to Radio EcoShock. This is Radio EcoShock. My guest is Tim Garrett from the University of Utah. Now, I did discover that you have a blog called Nephilog, as you say. 
Does Nephlog mean something? Oh, it's a totally silly name, but uh, um, nephology is a 19th century word for uh, the study of clouds. And I, I find it amusing that cloud physicists like myself almost uniformly have never heard of this word. So uh, it's, it's uh, slightly ironic that those who practice a profession don't know what their profession is called. So I'm, I guess, uh, whimsically trying to resurrect the word nephology, and I just called it a nephologue, you know, as in a monologue, but a nephologue. I don't know. I think of clouds when I think of these problems related to, let's say, civilization growth, because I see commonalities between all what I would say thermodynamically open systems and how they behave, and I have some sense of how clouds work, and I try to think about how that might relate to, let's say, civilization growth, another thermodynamically open complex system. Well, one of your blogs this summer really stimulated my brain activity because you related brain activity to the global economy. Are you suggesting that we have a previously uncatalogued sensory system in human brains that no value and know how economic transactions must work? Yeah, this is a fascinating question. Um, there seems to be a collective perception of how things, how much things are worth. And one thing I have tried to establish is that the global wealth of civilization, its I guess total value, is fundamentally tied to its rate of energy consumption. And that sort of poses the question of, well, how is it uh, that we as humans at a very individual level can have some sort of conception of the value of things when we really are, is, is the entirety of civilization is far too large for us to comprehend in any meaningful way. And here I think there is Again, some basic physics. It's the same physics that I would think of with respect to clouds. There's a concept um, that is called scale invariance or self-similarity, which is the idea that for a great, great many systems, um, as you see this everywhere in nature, whatever scale you look at, things look the same. So in the clouds, one way that this shows up is that if you look at, you know, large turbulent motions or small turbulent motions in a cloud, they'll, they'll look exactly the same. You, you don't really know what scale you're looking at unless you were told ahead of time. In terms of us in the context of the global civilization, I think of our brains being energy consuming thing on organisms, much like the entirety of civilization, what um, I think maybe one of your former guests, Nate Hagen, called um, a superorganism. And the consumption of energy by the entirety or by a small component exhibits similar behaviors physically. And, and the reason they exhibit similar behaviors and the small scales as well as the large scales, is that the small scales are connected to the large scales through energy transfers. Now, I know that sounds very abstract, but here's the basic idea. If you think about your daily life, you are connected to everybody else on this planet by a very small degree of number of degrees of separation. I could connect you to a distant Papua New Guinea's tribesman probably relatively quickly in, I would guess, perhaps six degrees of separation. Perhaps you know somebody um, who knows who has been to Australia, who met somebody in Australia, who traveled to Port Moresby for work, who met a tribesman who was coming to Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea, to get some luxury goods, who then went back to his tribe in the distant highlands. And it wouldn't be too far to make that connection. And all of this involves a transfer of energy and information back and forth between all of us. So I think of us as being a vibrating whole that consumes energy, where everybody's connected at the whole and at the local level, in fundamental ways. And it is through these connections that we collectively establish some sense of the worth of any given item. 
I do worry that this line of reasoning may be trapped within glasses made from physics and math and see everything through that lens. I mean, for example, take a dream. Do we care what energy the brain and the rest of the body may be burning during a dream? We, we can't measure that energy in the sleeper and think we understand the dream. And, and I'll raise one second case. Uh, you're talking about a physics-based formula to relate climate, energy, and the economy, and, and your language suggests human civilization is, is almost like a cell, and we inject energy like a sugar, and, and the cell grows. But uh, there's also things like ideas. I mean, without Einstein, we wouldn't be where we are, so there's the role of innovation. There's things other than energy and matter going on in this human system, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I think that that's a tempting perspective. Um, yeah, of course, I'm seeing things through the lens of physics because I believe that physics does underlie everything in the universe and it does lend itself to also testable hypotheses. And I do test these hypotheses to try to see if they can make meaningful predictions. So, I mean, that's one advantage of using physics is that it's theoretically based and it can lead to things that can potentially be disproved. But let's say you'd mention Einstein and his ideas. Einstein's ideas required energy consumption. The brain is a very energy-hungry organism. For most of us, it consumes about 20 or 25 watts. It's about 20 to 25 percent of the consumption of the human as a whole. Neuronal oscillations, the, mo the frequency of neuronal firing within the brain, follows the same laws of self-similarity or scale invariance that you see, let's say, in income distributions in, in, um, in humanity or in the size of turbulent eddies in a cloud or like the impacts of meteors, uh, the size of on, on the moon or a whole number of phenomena throughout the world. Our brains aren't actually fundamentally, at least statistically, all that different. And Einstein himself, he grew up in a wealthy society where, which could support the development of these ideas that could feed him and provide the sort of intellectual stimulation that would lead to him to coming up with these fantastic uh, uh, you know, conceptions of how the universe works. All of that would require energy. So you could think of Einstein as being in some way an extreme manifestation at the tail end of the spectrum of what a civilization produces. It's all part of a global whole where individual phenomena, like Einstein, are unpredictable at the individual level, but can be expected. We can expect wonderful ideas to come up in a wealthy civilization. And in an energy-constrained civilization where everybody is scrambling for their next meal, I think you would expect these to be less common. And I loved this comment that you posted August 20th in the blog. You said, unlike enhancing our sense of well-being and social survival by storing crops to prepare for the winter, a response embedded within us from eons of evolution, there is no obvious precedent for a similar response to climate change, so we focus on contemporary issues that are much too short to relieve us from our predicament. And I think you just explained our mass fascination with the Donald Trump show while our world heats up so dangerously. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I think economists talk about this, which is that if we do value things in the short run more than those in the long run, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in human behavior, of course, but it's, it, it is interesting that we can plan for the future, but we seem to plan most effectively for futures that we have experienced previously. So we can plan for retirement because it's built into our society's understanding that you need to do this because plenty of other people have planned for retirement in the past. And we model our retirement savings on what other people have experienced. We naturally plan for storing crops for the winter because <laughs> if there wasn't a history of doing so, well, we wouldn't be here today. Climate change seems different. You know, it's not 
it's not the same. I mean, what's the what's the collective memory that we have of a similar event? We don't. I don't think we have it. Maybe somewhere in our brains there was the arrival of the ice in the ice ages, and we all had to move south or or change what we were eating. But that's not the same at all, is it? Yeah, it was rather a long time ago. I mean, I don't feel I have in my thinking some sort of built-in planning for a future ice age. And maybe the reason is that these um, climate changes in the past tended to happen over sufficiently long periods of time that still, I mean, relative to the lifespan of a human, that still the dominant thing anybody would ever think of would be planning for the winter, not planning for temperatures being a couple degrees colder 100 years from now. Well, I've just been reading that our homes are totally designed for the cold, and, and we're trying to keep the cold out and use insulation and so on, and not for the heat. So we've misdesigned our houses for the future that is developing. Yep. Well, I just uh, mortgaged my house to buy some land up at 8,800 feet in the mountains nearby. So that's my future refrigerator. Wow. (laughs) Okay. Well, now, one last uh, point on the economic front. You attribute what I call, or what many call, the Great Acceleration after 1950 to increased energy availability. But then I ask myself, well, what if the economy crashes due to war or human misunderstanding or just plain greed, and there could be no direct relationship to energy availability at all? Well, I don't think history bears that out. Again, I'm not a historian, but look, if everybody's doing well and there's a ton of energy out there and everybody can grow successfully, is there really that much of a need to be killing one another? I, I, I don't I don't see that. I, I see that you know wars tend to crop out when there is for a competition for resources, and you know we've been in a period of extraordinarily extraordinary wealth since 1950 because of this of flourishing discoveries of things like oil and natural gas, and eventually that will come to a halt. So it's not until then that myself personally, I would expect that things like wars and inflation would rear their head. I mean, it will happen. Uh, These resource scarcity issues will happen. I mean, it can happen in two ways. One is that we run out of the raw materials, or another is that they just become much more difficult to access, even if they are out there because things like climate change start to become such a burden that it destroys the infrastructure that we have and use to access those resources. So, I mean, resource scarcity is a question of availability. Uh, We can deplete. We can make things less available by depleting it. We can also make things less available by a fraying of the fabric of civilization that is used to access those resources, and that can happen by way of environmental destruction. And it's at that point that I would expect things like wars to become increasingly common. But we've seen a trend since the 50s of decreasing deaths from wars, so it doesn't... You're you're right historically. I mean, Japan went to war after they were surrounded by the American Navy and cut off from the energy supplies they needed for their new economy. And Germany similarly wanted to invade Russia in order to get at the Balkans' oil because their economy needed more energy. So I I guess it does hold up. But to your point you just made, beyond science and philosophy, it looks to me like billions of humans are headed into a great time of suffering. I don't know if that's in this decade or the next, but by, say, 2050, for a number of reasons. Would you share that? Yeah. Um, I mean, of course, there's suffering at all times. And I think it's some of, I mean, many people today are suffering incredibly. I mean, you just look at a place like Syria 
And I think the question is whether things like Syria or Venezuela will become increasingly common in the future. And yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do expect that to happen. Um, I mean, you and I, we live in extraordinarily rich countries that may be able to insulate themselves for a time, but the United States and Canada are connected to the rest of the world. We aren't isolated. We are connected through international trade, and everybody wants to live somewhere. There's refugees looking for somewhere to live. One thing that um, you see in systems growth is um, when something's growing incredibly rapidly, I would use the word super exponential growth or explosive growth. So it's not just that there is growing exponentially with a constant rate of return, but the rate of return itself is increasing with time. Uh, and that's the situation we've been in since 1950. When you see explosive growth, you tend to see that followed by explosive collapse when the conditions that supported that explosive growth are no longer there. So, you know, there's, when we talk about the future and there being um, a fraying or a decline or whatever it is, I, I think of there being two modes of decline. One is a gradual decline, like civilization does subside, but it does so gradually in a maybe arguably fairly ordered fashion. And the other is um, a super exponential decline, where the rate of decline itself accelerates, and that would be a collapse. So maybe an analog is just to think about an ocean wave. You could think of an ocean wave moving up and down. Maybe us, like a cork on that wave, moving up and down, and it would move up gradually and come down gradually. Or you could also have a situation where that wave explodes upwards as it approaches the beach. And then ultimately when it runs out of water, it collapses, it crashes on the beach. I suspect, I hate to think of this that way, but I suspect that based on civilization's recent past, we are more like that wave approaching the beach than like a wave that will subside and perhaps rise again out in the middle of the ocean. Tim Garrett, if we are all part of a superorganism following inexorable laws of physics, does it matter what any of us does or whether we fear the future or enjoy the present? I mean, yeah, I mean, I can tell you my own feeling, and I guess that's what you're asking. Uh, I mean, I, myself, you know, I mean, I have a family, I have friends, I, you know, I, I'm concerned about the state of the world, and I truly want to believe that, you know, there is the capacity for individuals to make a difference in the ultimate trajectory of civilization. And I'll admit that myself, I struggle to reconcile that with what I see with testable hypotheses based on fundamental physics which suggests that ultimately, and in a statistical fashion, one way or another, civilization is on a trajectory, and us as individuals cannot change that trajectory because it is determined by things that are beyond us, such as just simply the geology of the planet, whether or not the energy reserves that feed civilization are out there. I suspect this superorganism idea is really correct. Uh, it is, civilization is a superorganism that will grow into the resources that sustain it, like uh, cells in a petri dish, until until it can't, and then it will grow to the maximum extent possible until no further growth is possible, and then the collapse will start to happen. Isn't that what stars do? Well, everything does this. No, this is it's not yes, yes, this is what stars do, but they're everything in the universe is a consequence of an initial available of an availability of energy and matter. That's what created it in the first place. And that energy and matter had to come from somewhere. And when an energy and matter runs out, 
that thing can no longer sustain its internal circulations, and it dies. So, Tim, are you thinking all the time? Help us understand you. Oh, I drink beer. You know, that helps. (laughs) Well, what I do is I garden, and uh, I do put away food for the winter. I've just been doing that. I've been putting away squash and tomato sauces on my stove, thickening, and uh, I've picked all the apples from my apple tree. And somehow those, I would say, age-old activities help soothe my brain from talking to scientists who upset my brain. Yeah, we all have our coping techniques. Definitely. If you have a story idea or thoughts on something you've heard, contact us, radio at org. That's radio at ecoshock.org. Does Tim Garrett know what is next for Tim Garrett? Do you know what you're going to be working on? I'm, I'm, I'm totally fascinated by this cloud problem. You know, it's just, so I was working on the cloud, and I can't, managed to finally break through, I think, in trying to come up with these statistical laws. And now so much seems so much more clear, like, with so many situations. I was just teaching a class yesterday, and I found a paper from 2005 that was showing how this thing called power laws or self-similarity or scale invariance, you just see it absolutely everywhere. It's so fascinating. I mean, it's things like the frequency of words in Moby Dick perfectly follows a predictable power law or wealth of people in civilization or or clouds or droplets or I mean or the firing of neurons in the brain. They all follow the exact same mathematical law. And this has me fascinated and I think I have some sort of understanding of why this is the case now. It's basically with a finite amount of energy and matter everybody has to share. And it's like the line from the Bible, and probably paraphrasing, paraphrasing, the poor are always with us. There will always be a few rich and many poor. And that's because everybody has to share. There will be more poor who have as much wealth collectively as the very few rich. And there's sort of a, a principle called equipartition here. So the number times the wealth is invariant with the amount of wealth the person has. And so one question I have in my mind right now, thinking about the economy, is what will happen with um, income inequality in the future? We see rising income inequality right now. I suspect that's quite predictable. As the world gets richer, there will be the uber-rich, and the poor are always with us. And there's um, going to be a continued expansion of that separation for as long as the world gets wealthier. And then I would expect a contraction, too, as the world um, gets, as as competition for resources increases. And then you start thinking about, well, how would that play out in terms of, let's say, political systems? Do we have things like capitalism becoming no longer a viable option in a resource-constrained environment? I mean, it's just armchair philosophizing, of course, but it's based upon um, sort of thinking about how physical systems work and some sort of recognition that humanity itself behaves like a physical system. As we wrap up, is there some place where we can find in one place that basic formula that you've just been talking about? I just posted a tweet yesterday about it, (laughs) about income distributions. Uh, I I mean, there is the paper that's online about the clouds. I I think, you know, for most listeners, perhaps even a lot of people in my field, it might be a bit esoteric. I'll put out a blog post. You've encouraged me now, as, as you have in the past, to write about these topics. I'll try to present a a very simple explanation for this basic idea of um, scale invariance in economic systems. It's it's not that complicated, and I think it can be um, explained succinctly with words. We will be looking for it. That is it for this journey into clouds and a cloudy future. 
We've been speaking with Dr. Tim Garrett, Professor of Atmospheric Physics at the University of Utah. You can find links to the papers and the blogs and videos in my own show blog at ecoshock.org. Tim, talking with you, I do feel a little bit small compared to a larger man, so thank you so much for coming back. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Alex. It's all, it's been, every single time, it's been a great pleasure to talk with you. You're an excellent interviewer. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. Please don't forget to support Radio Ecoshock. Help pay those bills. You can donate at our website at ecoshock.org or at our show blog at ecoshock.info.